This is going to be Genesis 36. And we're going to talk about the generations of Esau. And talk about the topic of leaving the promised land. That's what Esau did is he left the promised land. But it says in Genesis 36, 1. Now these are the generations of Esau who is Edom. Now Esau means hairy. And Edom means red. Genesis 25, 25. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment. And they called his name Esau. So Esau means red. And then Genesis 25, 30. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage. For I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. So there you have it. There's what his names mean and over and over you'll see in this chapter that Esau is Edom and the Lord is wanting to make that clear the Edomites come from Esau and they have a book of the Bible dedicated to talking about their judgment that they're going to get from God and that's the book of Obadiah the short book of Obadiah but you see Esau pictures the flesh he pictures your sinful flesh and obviously your flesh would want to leave the promised land if you ever got to it. You see, when you get saved, when you first get saved, you're wandering around in the wilderness. And when you get to that victorious Christian life, you've entered your promised land. And your flesh wouldn't want to stay there. It would want to go back to Egypt. But you see, Esau pictures the flesh, and this can picture how the flesh thinks it's covered because Esau, his flesh is hairy, and it's red, as we just talked about. This can picture how the flesh thinks it's covered. This can picture how the flesh doesn't think it needs the blood because it's already red. Esau was red all over like a hairy garment in Genesis 36.2 says, Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elam the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion the Havite. So Esau likes wild women, just like your flesh. You see, your flesh didn't want a God-fearing woman. It wanted to run around with the wild women. He got the daughters of Canaan to be his wife, even though he should have had better sense than that. And these type of wives aren't going to care about staying in the promised land. And Genesis 26, 34 through 35, And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, and Bethshemeth, the daughter of Elam the Hittite, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. You see, the women Esau chose were a grief of mind to his parents. Esau, like your flesh, will take a wife who doesn't care anything about the Lord. He's just simply led by lust. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And Paul says in 1 Corinthians seven thirty nine that if you get married, it needs to be only in the Lord. It was never God's idea for men to take multiple wives either, as Esau does. No wonder he left the promised land. In Mark ten seven through 8, it says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain, but one flesh. In Deuteronomy seventeen seventeen, it says, Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. That his heart turned not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. In 1 Timothy 3, 2, it says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So in Mark 10, 7 through 8, it says, Cleave to his wife, not wives. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, it says, Not to multiply wives. In 1 Timothy 3, 2, when it gives the qualifications for a pastor, which are good qualifications for you, even if you're not one. It says, be the husband of one wife. So all through the Bible, the Lord lets us know he wants us to be one man and one woman. 
Esau didn't listen. Solomon didn't listen. He multiplies wives, and look what, ha look what happens in 1 Kings 11, 7 through 8. It says, Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemish, the abomination of Moab, and the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. So his his wives, all these wives he got, got him off into this idolatry, this idol worship, making high places, worshiping Moloch. But now Esau's wives in Genesis 36, 2, Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion the Havite. The name of Ada, Esau's wife, means adornment, adornment. That means to deck or decorate. Uh, when you adorn yourself, you're like decorating yourself. Maybe this has to do with the fact that Esau is about the flesh. And these type of people are interested in being all decked out, as they say. So Israel, the nation of Israel, talking about them, they'll get all decked up when they went after their false gods. In Hosea 2.13, it says, And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burned incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers, and forget me, said the Lord. Isn't that something when Israel was going after her lovers, her false gods, she decked herself, she adorned herself with earrings and jewels, and forgot the Lord. It would be wise for a woman's adorning to be godly. Like it says in 1 Timothy 2, 9, And like men are also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. See, this doesn't mean you can't wear earrings and jewels and dress nice. It just means don't let that be what you're about. You know, you need to be about the Lord, pleasing the Lord. What would he want you to do first? But that's not like the type of women that Esau got. Genesis 36, 2. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elan the Hittite, and Aholibama, the daughter of Ana, the daughter of Zibion the Havite. Now, Aholibama sounds like he's calling out, calling Obama holy, Aholibama. But I doubt Esau would even do that. But a holy bama means tent of the high place. And I think that's interesting because high places are almost always negative in the Bible. And that's where men went to worship their false gods. That is where our spiritual enemies dwell, the high places. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. A holy bama means tent of the high place. So his wives' names are very interesting. Verse 3, And Bashemath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nebajoth. So her name, <clears throat> Bashemath, her name means perfumed or sweet-smelling. You see, this world was smelling really good to Esau. It will have that effect on your flesh. You see, Esau's a type of the, of the flesh. The things of this world look good and smell good and feel good to the flesh. I just think that's interesting, the names of these wives. If you look them up, they go right along with this, if you use your imagination. But he took to wife the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, who was born into this world by Hagar, an Egyptian and type of the world. Your flesh would love to marry into the world. Your flesh would love to leave the promised land and go back to Egypt. In Genesis 36, 4, And Ada bare to Esau Eliphaz, and Bashemeth bare Reel. Now, Eliphaz means endeavor of God, and Reel means friend of God. Maybe this could picture how the flesh would like to look religious. So they named their kids these pious-sounding names. In Genesis 36, 5, And Aholibama bare Jaish, and Jalem, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. 
And this chapter can be kind of hard to follow, sort of, because it's a genealogy. But you just read it over and over until you realize, well, this is talking about Esau and his family. That's what the whole chapter is pretty much about. So Esau had children who were born in the promised land. But he still leaves. For what it's worth, Jeush, that J-E-U-S-H means, he that is devoured. You see, you mess around with the world, that's what's going to happen. And then Jalam, J-A-L-A-A-M, which almost sounds like Balaam, uh, which is a bad character in the Bible. But Jalam means hidden young man or heir. A Korah, this is a different Korah than you have in the book of Numbers, but the name means baldness, ice, or frost. Now Genesis 36, 6, And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance, which he had got in the land of Canaan, and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. So he left the promised land. And when you leave the promised land, you cause your household to leave too. So it's not just hurting you. In Romans 14, 7, it says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. The things you do are going to affect other people around you. What's one of the main reasons he left? Well, Look at verse 7. It says, For their riches were more than that they might dwell together. And the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. So Esau and Jacob had so much, so much riches that Esau thought they wouldn't be able to even dwell together. So never let your material wealth cause you to break fellowship or get away from the people of God. That's what Esau did. And he left. And the Bible warns us about Riches. It says in 1 Timothy 6, 17, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Mark four nineteen, it talks about the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches. Riches are deceitful. You can get confidence in your riches to the point that you forget about the riches in Christ. It says in Ephesians 3, 8, And to me, who am less than least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You see, when you get saved, you become part of the body of the person who has unsearchable riches. Now, Genesis 36, 8, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. No, it just keeps telling you that over and over and over again. So, we know Esau's Edom. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. And these are the names of Esau's sons, who we've already talked about. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. Reel, the son of Beshemeth, the wife of Esau. And the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepha, and Gotam, and Kenaz. So this is Eliphaz. There is an Eliphaz the Temanite in the book of Job. Read Job 2.11. Probably not the same Eliphaz, but this could be further proof that Job happened around this same time period. In Genesis 36.12, And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she buried Eliphaz, Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. And I talked about in the last lesson that a concubine here, although considered as like a lesser wife, a concubine is still a wife nonetheless. And if you laid with a man's concubine, you still took his wife. In Genesis thirty-six, thirteen, and 14, and these are the sons of Reel, Nahath, and Zerah, Shema, and Mizah. These were the sons of Beshemath, Esau's wife. And these were the sons of a holy Bama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. And she bare to Esau, Jeish, and Jalem, and Korah. 
And you're probably thinking to yourself, why are these genealogies in the Bible? You know, these long list of names. Well, it reveals to us a lot of things. One thing is, it reveals us how good God is at chronicling things. You know, he loves to chronicle things. I'm the same way. I like to write down a bunch of information and just keep it stored up for me to come back and read later. It's a scary thing in a way that God has everything chronicled out. Everything you've ever done is wrote down somewhere other than your sins that are washed in the blood. But I mean, if you're lost, everything you've ever done is wrote down in a book. And God writes these genealogies because God is mindful of man. Why is he mindful of man? I have no idea. But this is a comfort to me that God is even interested in these men who are nobodies in the Bible. Even the generations of Esau. These weren't good people. These were people who are fleshly, even a type of the flesh type of people here. And he still gave them a whole chapter to chronicle out their whole family. That gives me comfort because I know he is therefore definitely interested in me. Because I'm part of his family tree, you see. Not because I'm special, but because I've got the blood of Jesus on me and I'm applied. I'm, I've been, his, his blood's applied to me and that put me in the family tree. So therefore, he's definitely interested in me and you. He's interested in these people that are lost. How much more so people that's a child of the king, you see. So the genealogy could be a, should be a comforting thing to you. And God also writes these genealogies because people are interested in people. You see, for example, many times at work, the older men will ask me, now who was your mother? Who was your father? You see, they're interested in where I came from. People are interested in people. And that's all these genealogies are. Who was this guy's mother? Who was this guy's father? And it's just laying that out for you. Now it's going to get into these dukes. In Genesis 36, 15, it says, These were dukes of the sons of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau, Duke Teman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepha, <clears throat> Duke Kenaz. So a duke, like the chief of the family, is what they are. They're like the chiefs of the family. So when, he, when Esau went to war, he put up his dukes. That's where you get the saying. You see, these verses always remind me of the show Dukes of Hazard. I've never really seen it. It's a popular show. But it, this, uh, I've, I've heard about it so much. So that these uh, verses have always reminded me of the Dukes of Hazard. These are the Dukes of Esau. Genesis thirty six sixteen through 20. Duke Korah, Duke Gotam, and Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that came of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada. And these are the sons of Reel, Esau's son. Duke Nahoth, Duke Zira, Duke Shema, Duke Mizza. These are the dukes that came of Ruel in the land of Edom. These are the sons of Beshemath, Esau's wife. And these are the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife. Duke Jish. Duke Jalem, Duke Korah, these were the dukes that came of Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. These are the sons of Esau, who was Edom, and these are their dukes. These are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land, Lotan, and Shobal, and Zibion, and Anna. <clears throat> Lotan. That may sound familiar to you if you watch the YouTube channel KJV Pictures. The creator of that channel's name was Lotan. I wonder if he knew his name's in the Bible. Okay, so here is the family of Seir who inhabited the land before Esau. It says in verse 21, And Dishon and Ezer and Dashan, these are the dukes of the Horites, the children of Seir in the land of Edom, and the children of Lotan were Horai and Hemim, and Lotan's sister was Timnah. And the children of Shobal were these, Alvin and Manahath, and Ebal, and Shepho, and Onam. 
And these are the children of Zibion, both Aja and Ana. This was that Ana that found the mules in the wilderness as he fed the asses of Zibion, his father. You see, through these genealogies, uh, you a lot of times come up on a little story in them. This guy right here, Ana that found the mules in the wilderness as he fed the asses of Zibion, his father. Sounds like a pretty insignificant story. This guy found the mules in the wilderness. What can we get out of that? Well, he's working for his father, right? On your way, you know, working for the father, you'll find some things. He was working for his father and he found some things. If he would have stayed home that day, he wouldn't have found anything. So there you go. Get out, do something, work for God, the father. You're going to find some things. If you get in the Bible and work and labor and the word and doctrine, you're going to find some things. If you close the book and stay home, you won't go, you're not going to find anything. And the children of Ana were these, Dashon and Aholibama, the daughter of Ana. And these are the children of Dashon, Himdan and Eshbon and Ithran and Chiran. The children of Ezer are these, Bilhan and Zavan and Achan. The children of Dashan are these, Uz and Aram. These are the dukes that came of the Horites, Duke Lotan, Duke Shobal, Duke Zibion, Duke Ana, Duke Dashan, Duke Ezer, Duke Dashan. These are the dukes that came of Horai among their dukes in the land of Seir. And these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. And remember that Moses wrote this. And he just said that these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before there reigned any king over the children of Israel. Moses wrote this before anyone knew there would be kings over Israel. This shows that Moses was given direct revelations when he was writing. And you're going to notice that Edom has kings before Israel has kings. And you might remember how Israel's demand for a king was their downfall. They got Saul, the people's choice. And he messed them all up. Now the Edomites have kings before Israel. You see the flesh, you know, Esau, the Edomites picture the flesh and the flesh would love to place itself as king on the throne of its own heart now here are these kings of edom genesis 36 32 and bela the son of beor reigned in edom and the name of his city was dinaba and bela died and jobab the son of zira of basra reigned in his stead and Jobab died, and Husham of the land of Timnah reigned in his stead. And Husham died, and Hadad, the son of Bedad, who smote Midian in the field of Moab, reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Avith. And Hodad died, and Samla of Mazrika reigned in his stead. And Samla died, and Saul of Rehoboth by the river reigned in his stead. Notice there's another Saul in the Bible. This isn't the same King Saul that wanted David dead. And it isn't the same Saul that we know as the Apostle Paul. It's another Saul. And then it says, And Saul died, and Belhanan the son of Akbor reigned in his stead. And Belhanan the son of Akbor died, and Hadar reigned in his stead. And the name of his city was Peu. And his wife's name was Mahitabal, the daughter of Matred, the daughter of Mazihab. And these are the names of the dukes that came of Esau according to their families after their places by their names, Duke Timna, Duke Alva, Duke Jethath, Duke Aholibama, Duke Elah, Duke Panon, Duke Kenaz, Duke Teman, Duke Mibzar, Duke, Duke Magdiel, Duke Aram. These be the dukes of Edom according to their habitations and the land of their possessions. He is Esau, the father of of the Edomites. Once again, letting you know that Esau is Edom. So it said that like four, three or four or five times in there, Esau is Edom. And, you know, there was still quite a few little cool nuggets in this chapter, even though most of it was just naming off people's names. And see, this is a chapter a lot of people would just skip over and think that there's nothing in it, but there were still quite a few little cool things in there and I wish I could give you more information on it 
it seems like about the only thing left you could do would be look up all these people's names and write them down in your Bible. Maybe get something out of it that way. And I thought about doing that, but then I thought, well, that would take up a couple hours of the audio of just telling what people's names are. But this has been Genesis chapter 36. And Genesis 37, one of my favorite chapters in Genesis, it gets into Joseph, the greatest type of Christ in all the Bible. So it's going to be very interesting. Uh, I've already got it finished. I just got to record it. And it's got, I'd say, at least 50 to 60 just uh, similarities between Jesus and Joseph just in that one chapter. So I think you'll really enjoy it.